Hey, we got round, we got shell casings. Yeah. yeah. It starts out as uh, something that you've trained for all your life, trying to make a difference. The cool thing is, as an A-10 pilot, on times when the stars align and you're up on that mission, uh, where you get to make a difference, you get to see the reward. That's my whole soul and being, is that guy on the ground. Uh, you know, he could be an 18-year-old guy, 18-year-old kid with a rifle and uh, that's all he's got and I'm here to protect him. The first time I ever saw an A-10 was when I was in Army basic training uh, at Fort Leonard Wood. So I, although I grew up around general aviation and knew a lot about civilian airplanes, I had actually never heard of an A-10 until uh, I was doing road marches uh, during basic training. How I got interested in the A-10, uh, I can still remember it to this day. Uh, it, I was at a uh, uh, a hobby store because I like a lot of kids interested in aviation I built a lot of airplane models and uh, and this was 1979 I was in in high school um, and went to the hobby store and they had a model of a Ravel model of the the for then brand new a10 uh, it, it had only been operational for a couple of years at that point and I just saw and I remember I can still remember to this day looking at the the wall of models and just trying to pick what I was going to build next and I saw this the box and the picture on it. I was like, what in the world is that? And uh, obviously it's a pretty unique airplane. I mean, now we don't think about it too much. Uh, but, but back then, I mean, I, it was totally unique with the two engines mounted up high and the big gun sticking out of the nose and it was just a very unique airplane. I saw it and said, what in the world is this thing? It initially got utilized as an anti-armor uh, platform and that's why some people call it the tank killer because in that phase of its life, uh, that was its main uh, main job. I was a uh, first lieutenant. Uh, I was 26 years old uh, when, when Desert Storm kicked off. The 26-year-old fighter pilot caught the nation's attention a few months ago when he and a partner shot down a record number of Iraqi tanks. You just never forget when you look down and realize that somebody's trying to shoot you down and you've got to, to, uh, to kill him first. We are very proud today to have It's, uh, it doesn't seem that long ago to me, but uh, I know talking to a lot of the guys now, you know, they're, it, it, it's uh, been quite a while ago. And, and when you look at the airplane from then to now, it's, it's pretty amazing the different upgrades and, uh, that we've gone through since then. The A-10 is the only airframe ever that was built entirely for this mission. Its sole purpose in life is close air support. Oh, come on, man. They're about to do a gun run. You need to get down. Let's go, buddy. Come on, man. <laughs> Day again, baby. <laughs> uh. 
Some people say it's the tank killer, but that actually isn't true. This airplane was designed as a close air support aircraft. Uh, the whole concept came out of the, uh, the lack of capability of some airframes in Vietnam. And they said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna learn from this war and build an airplane that is perfect for close air support. It's an awesome testament to the, to the aircraft, I think, that the, the same gun that we used to kill main battle tanks in 1991 is the same gun where uh, we can shoot a single insurgent uh, that's fleeing on a, on a motorcycle or, uh, or uh, shooting our, at our guys from a, uh, from a tree line. People sit there and they, they try to make a weakness of the A-10, right? So they, they try to designate the weakness of the A-10 as a, it's a singular mission focus. I think that's our greatest strength. Um, and I wish we would promote it. So we care about guys on the ground. We do our mission in relationship to guys on the ground. We are support element essentially for the Army. Um, we're the red-headed stepchild of the Air Force. That's where we're at. That close air support expertise, when the A-10 is gotten rid of, or, or if it is getting, gotten rid of, and you get all these multi-role fighters, you lose that expertise because it's not number one in the Air Force goals. It's not number one in the Army's goals. The only way it's number one is in the A-10's goals. That's where it's number one. Um, and it's not a political statement. It's really not. It's more of we care about the guy on the ground. Um, there's, I'm not saying air addiction mission isn't caring about the guy on the ground, but it's not tangible. You can't really grab the benefits of it right then. You're gonna wait a certain amount of time to see its effects. Air to air, how's that about the guy on the ground? Well, you're building air superiority, air supremacy, correct. But is the guy on the ground gonna see it, get the tangible benefits of it? No. Close air support is about the guy on the ground. We work extensively with Joint Tactical Air Controllers, Special Operations Forces uh, from all branches of the military, not just the Air Force. Extensive training back stateside um, that lets us kind of learn their lingo, learn the ground situation that they're facing on the ground. Um, then. Uh, on the, other, on the flip side of that, they get to understand how we operate, they get to see our sensors, they get to see how we employ weapons. Sensors are great, they're amazing, they, they enable precision strike, they enable us to generate coordinates that, that are pristine, that are right on the target, but that will never replace just you know looking right outside of my cockpit and looking at the battle space. What am I seeing out there big picture? Because so many sensors have a soda straw view of the battle space that, yeah, I can see right here in this 20 meter area, but I can't see what's at 35 meters. And maybe at 35 meters are some additional friendly forces that the JTAC that I'm talking to, who's 100 meters east of that target, doesn't know is over there. We do have this personal connection with the people that we uh, so closely work with, the, the guy on the ground. Uh, we hear uh, him getting scared. Meters. Uh, we hear him getting excited. Here we go, that's it. Good hit, good hit, good hit! Dash 2, I need you in the same, same remark, same restrictions. We hear the bullets flying. We hear him taking cover, we hear him breathing hard. Uh, and and it's, it's, it becomes a very personal, uh, a very personal mission, uh, especially when, when you start hearing about guys uh, taking casualties uh, down there. You take that, that hits very, very close to home. Nobody ever wants to hear that. Okay, uh, today we're going down to Sande Sufla. We've been there recently, so we've got a good lay of the land. Um, keep in mind, 
the spiny's been pretty hot recently and they've had some contact from the same area around Sande Souf. Uh, he went over the recent activity, keep in mind the uh, kind of MO we've had recently out of there. They've seen the, the Taliban commander kind of looking at the objective first, doing a quick meeting, picking up weapons en route. Usually there's motorcycles involved. Uh, you've also got the uh, Taliban commander that they uh, seeked a couple weeks ago. So you've got all that stuff going on right there in Aspandi. We're going right into the heat of that. So keep that in mind as, uh, as we get down there, keep your eyes open and uh, stay vigilant. All right, so our actions on contact, near and far ambush, return fire. Look to me, we'll either maneuver or we'll push through. IED, get 360 degree security and clear the danger area. And then we'll look to Kazavak. Uh, in the case of a complex attack, we're gonna return fire, move out of the kill zone. Indirect fire, get down, look for uh, distance and direction from me. Our actions on halt, take a knee, face out, and uh, the march intervals that we're gonna use are gonna be dependent on where we are uh, in the open area, spread out as much as you can. The bigger we can look and the more intimidated we can look, the uh, less likely we're gonna take contact as we move down there. That's all I've got, what are your questions? All right, we're kidding up. Zero six one five. Zero six one five. Kids on. So uh, yesterday, as most days, we went out on a dismounted patrol uh, south of our fob to a village of Aspondi. Basically, we got some intel that uh, some bad guys were storing weapons in a building, and we had contacted them before, we'd run into them before. Um, however, our, uh, our biometrics assets didn't have the full uh, dossier on the individuals that we had detained, so we had to let them go. We pushed through across, we got over to uh, the town, we pushed in, set up, we set up in, in front of a, a clot that we knew had uh, previously there'd been a uh, Taliban commander living in. The Afghan National Police were there with us and uh, they went in and searched the house, brought, the, brought four guys out of the house. We, uh, Question them tactically, like space, like had them all separated from each other, so they didn't, they couldn't be talking while we were questioning them. He said everybody is teachers here, so we are good people. Okay, if they're blah, 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 blah. good people, they have nothing to worry about. Yeah. We're not, they, we're not yeah, going to Guys, that just their stories didn't match up. Unfortunately, we weren't able to detain them. We enrolled them in the Sikh. Before we left the town, um, we were getting uh, reports, intel reports, that uh, the Taliban were massing forces, which, I mean, it's a common report, you know. But it's one of those things that, you know, unless we have confirmed visual, we can't really do much. So we just had to continue uh, moving back to the base. Yeah. yeah. But as we were headed back to the base, we had to cross about two kilometers of open desert. We got about 500 meters outside of the village and started taking uh, some pretty accurate fire. We're definitely in a, a huge open danger area, and it was there was no cover. I mean, there were people trying to find tire tracks to hide to get a little bit of a defilade behind. 
Which tree line? Oh. Where? Let's go for that tree line right there. Hey, one fucking tree line. All right, hang on. You know, in that position, the best you can do is spread out, gain fire superiority, you know, and then wait for for some air support. Comms were a bit of an issue at the time, and so they had a little bit of a struggle, uh, but they did have uh, A-10s luckily being pushed down to us. I have your position south of the tree line. Luckily the enemy broke contact first uh, after some effective fire from, from our platoon, um, and we started RTBN. Somebody's fucking shooting at us still. We were taking some harassing fire at that point, uh, but luckily we had uh, the A-10s on station to uh, come in and do a nice show of force, which is always a, uh, a clincher for the enemy because they know what that entails. Ground troops that I work with, uh, when they think close air support, they think A-10s. Uh, if you tell them something else, you, you can always kind of hear them like, I don't care about that. Like, tell me when A-10s are on station. And I think the reason for that is uh, they almost share the same mentality. Um, if you were to say that there's a grunt in the sky, it would be a hog pilot. I am their uh, JTAC, Joint Terminal Attack Controller. Uh, what I do is uh, advise on air assets, capabilities, uh, assist um, with those air assets as well as uh, control them if uh, we need to go kinetic and get uh, some ordnance out of the sky so, and get uh, bombs on target. Not having an A-10 around uh, and its future uh, in such an uncertain state is, is to me a shame. You know, for the Air Force to want to get rid of the A-10 to me is them saying there's no longer be any ground wars. To win a war you need boots on the ground and to have boots on the ground you need support and you need the right kind of support to have boots on the ground and it's the A-10 honestly. Even sometimes just the sound or just telling the ground commander hey A-10's on its way or we have aircraft supporting that we hear five mics and you ask what it is you say hey we got an A-10 coming on it's 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 uh yeah it, it picks them up a little bit. That sound is so distinguishable. Nice. Good effect. It literally shakes the ground. It is amazing. Uh, you hear it first when it fires, and then you hear it echo from the gun in the sky. It, it, that sound right there just drives 11 Bravos nuts. It's amazing. Just I just shit my pants. <laughs> oh, yeah. Woo! That's that sort of it's, it's that sound of uh, uh, <laughs> corny like freedom, but it, it really is. It's just, it's the sound of don't mess with me. It, it scares off everyone and shows you you're in good hands. For me, having been in the Air Force since, you know, commissioning in right after September 11th, you know, and having known nothing but this combat uh, theater over here in Afghanistan, I know that when you're talking to a, a 19 to a 35 year old man on the end of a radio who's scared and just needs some help right then, he doesn't care about fiscal constraints. He doesn't care about big picture Air Force policy. He doesn't care about the next fancy weapon system coming down the pipeline. He cares about being saved right then and there. The job's important. Like I said, I don't have any problem sleeping at night doing stuff that would usually make uh, your psychology a little bit off. Uh, I don't have a problem killing people and blowing stuff up because when I hear that JTAG get freaked out, uh, if I had to kill a lot of people, 
it's because that guy was trying to kill my brother in arms down on the ground. That's what I was born and bred to do in the Air Force. It's amazing to be in this job, to be able to know that uh, through interactions with JTACs, that my job matters to people. I'm very lucky to be that way. There are very few jobs, I think, in the world that have that much real feedback from people to say, I appreciate what you do. It, it makes it, uh, it's very humbling It's that uh, we are so trusted and, and liked by the ground forces. I think that's something that uh, I'm very, very proud of. They love this airplane uh, and, and uh, they trust us is the biggest thing. I mean, when you're shooting last night, uh, we just looked at it, it was uh, between 65 and 100 meters away from the, from the friendly guys. And for those guys to, to trust us, uh, to do that uh, on a regular basis uh, is, uh, is very gratifying. I'm convinced that when the history books are written about my generation of aviators, there's no doubt that the A-10 will be a key point of what air power has provided uh, in the world and in the, in the global battle space. The evidence speaks to itself of what the airplane has done. So. Uh, there's no denying what the airplane's capable of doing and what it's done for nearly 15 years straight. You've got a huge group of experts at what they do with a singular focus, and you can't really get that back once it's broken out.